Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Your story for tonight, written and directed by Willis Cooper and featuring Ernest Chappell, is called A Mile High and a Mile Deep. old would you say I am, partner? I bet you wouldn't guess in a million years. This beard would fool you, I suppose. Quite a set of whiskers. You'd probably guess me around 60, 65. Well, I'm not 60, 65, partner. Can't guess, huh? Well, I'll tell you. I'm 34. You wouldn't think it, would you? Practically everybody where I come from wears a beard. Montana. Silver Bow County. Butte, Montana. Mile high and a mile deep. Why, the city of Butte is almost exactly a mile above sea level, and the copper mines go down to the solid rock of the Bitterfoot Mountains more than a mile. Mile high, mile deep. Get it? See, this mountain the Butte sits on was pretty near solid copper once. Still a lot of it there, but in 70 or 80 years they've cleaned out a lot, too. That mountain's like a honeycomb now, with drifts and stopes and tunnels and crosscuts going every which way down under. Miles and miles of tunnels, bored out of the living rock at about a million levels. Used to have a joke they'd tell visitors that went down in the mines. Where's the nearest saloon, one fellow'd say. The other would come right back. One mile from here, he'd say. One mile, straight up. True, too. Gives you a funny feeling, doesn't it? If you're underground, you can think about all the people up there, up top, riding around in their automobiles buying groceries, talking to people, all that, and never giving you a thought, maybe. If you're walking down Broadway, Mercury Street, Arizona Street, you could maybe give your imagination a workout sometime, thinking about the guys in hard hats way down there in the bowels of the mountains, pecking away at the seams of copper with 17,000 million billion tons of rock pressing down on them with the heat sucking the sweat out of them and turning them into rags. Yeah, I should say so. Oh, it's different today. The mines are air-conditioned now, mostly. They've got ventilating plants three-quarters of a mile underground that'll serve a town of 2,000. Great big rooms of machinery 40, 50 feet high. Every bit of it brought down piece by piece, down a shaft maybe as big as your kitchen door. You'd be surprised what men and machinery can do, partner. And then again, you'd be surprised by what men and machinery can't do. A mile underground. I found out. I'll say I found out. I found out the hard way, partner. I wish you didn't have to leave that light on. It hurts my eyes. See, there isn't much light down there in the copper mines. Some places there isn't any light at all. Some places there's just hot, heavy darkness. And silence. Like a grave. Only in a grave there's a nice heavy coffin to keep the earth from pressing down on you. Down there, there's nothing. Just the naked rocks, and they're awful close. You know, it's a curious thing, 
There isn't much of the Earth's surface that people haven't seen. Sure, there's a few blank spots on the map, but throughout the millions of years the Earth's been here, people have learned a lot about the outside. They've even got a pretty fair knowledge of what's down in the ocean. But the inside of the Earth? You don't know much about that, do you? See, the Earth's about 8,000 miles from one side to the other. A few people have been down about maybe a mile, a mile and a half. The deepest mine in the world is just a scratch on the surface. The rest is a mystery. There's a few people who have a pretty good idea of what the rest of it's like. There's maybe half a dozen who know. Me, for instance. I know. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. It was January 26th, 1932. It doesn't seem like 16 years ago. It seems like 600. My father was assistant superintendent of one of the big mines. I had pretty much run of the place. He used to let me guide parties of tourists down below, take them down and answer all the silly questions, see they didn't get lost or smacked by a carload of ore or a loose shoe in the mud, you know. I knew that mine pretty well, about as well as anybody. Nobody, though, knows all the passageways down there. I told you there's hundreds of miles of them that are known. Also, there's some nobody knows about. Well, I had a party down at this 3,700-foot level. Eight of them, I remember. Four women and four men. Politicians and their wives from Pennsylvania. And Louis Sullivan was with me. A lad about my age that I used to run around with. His first time underground. I'd asked him to come along a half dozen times, but he'd always turn me down. Claustrophobia, isn't that what you call it? Fear of enclosed spaces? Yeah. I can still see Louis standing there with a raincoat on. It's damp down there, you know. And a hard hat with a miner's lamp on it. Breathing through his mouth and the sweat pouring down his face as I dropped the gate on the cage and rang the signal to take it away. Anyway, ain't we going? Ah, uh, the cage is pretty full, Louie. It'll be right down again. I don't like this, Link. <laughs> Cut it out, Louie. Can't breathe down here. Keep your shirt on. We'll be out in a few minutes. And I don't like the cage, either. Well, it's the only way to get out. It goes too fast. You'll get used to it. Not me. You're never going to get me down here again. How long before the cage will be down again? A few minutes. Oh, say, you want to see something? See what? The Indian writing. What Indian writing? Over here in this cross cut. I don't want to see it. Come on, we've got time. You ought to see it. What is it? Nobody knows. When they headed into this cross cut about eight years ago, they busted right into a tunnel that was already there. What? Yeah. Can you imagine that? 3,700 feet underground, a blind tunnel. You're crazy. I'm telling you, an Indian writing on the wall. I don't believe it. Come on and look. It's right here. I'll take your word for it, Link. No, no kidding. I won't get you lost. Come on. Well, you go first. Light your lamp. There's no light in there. Listen, Link. Come on, come on. The cage will be back down in a minute. Hey, hey wait, wait for me. Well, come on. Where are, where are you? Here, come on. Gee, don't go away like that, Link. Light your lamp. Here, I'll light it. Hold still. That's my last match. There. Okay? I don't like this place. Picture's right here. Where? Here, down close to the floor. See? Huh. See? The face? Yeah. It's... horrible. 
flames? People. Yeah, kind of scary. Did you say they found the place like this? Busted right into it. How could anybody get in here to draw those pictures? I don't know. Huh? Nobody knows. It must have been a passage of some kind up to the surface at one time, I suppose. What do you suppose it means? I don't know. Where does this tunnel go? I'm going to find out someday. Hasn't anybody ever been down there? You couldn't get one of these miners to go down there for a million bucks. Nor me. Well, I'm going to explore it some day, by golly. Well, you, you can do it some other day. Let's get out of here. Why don't you come with me when I do it, Louie? Listen, Link, if I ever get out of here, you're never going to get me down here again. Not ever. Don't be such a sap. Come on, let's go. I got a belly full. I'm scared. What are you scared of? What's there to be scared of down here? Sure. What was there to be scared of? The entrance to the lighted drift we'd come from was only twenty feet away. The cage to take us back to the surface would be there in a couple seconds. I stepped around a fall of rock that I knew like the back of my head, and there was the mouth of the passage. But it wasn't the right mouth. There was nothing out there but blackness. Thick, crawling blackness that plucked at the feeble lights in our hats. And there was a wind blowing. There shouldn't have been any wind. And then Louis Sullivan yelled at me. Link, my light's going out. And I said, don't be silly. These lights can't go out. But the light on his hat flickered and died. And then my light went out, too. Sixteen years ago, this coming 26th of January. Little kids that were just out of their ditties then have grown up and gone away to that war you had and come back heroes. Girls that were still in their ditties have kids of their own now. People that were in what you might call the prime of life then have died of old age since. And I haven't seen... Well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. You want to know what happened down there that afternoon? Two-thirds of a mile below where the snow was falling and the people were going out about their business. Maybe you might have been in Butte that Tuesday afternoon. You'd remember the headlines in the Standard Post about me, Lincoln Pendeveris Jr., son of the well-known mining executive, and Louis W. Sullivan, son of Mr. and Mrs. Vincent DePaul Sullivan, about us being lost. I heard about the search for us. It was one of the biggest, most fantastic searches in the history of Butte. It went on for weeks, almost. They scoured every inch of the workings, except for the tunnel where the Indian pictures were. You couldn't get those superstitious miners to go in there. And of course, they never found us. I don't want to get excited and emotional about this, partner. It would be easy to, and maybe before I get through, I may blow my top. If I do, you just go along with me and listen. I don't know whether you're going to believe all this or not. I don't particularly care. I've got something to get off my chest, and that's what I'm up to. You can flip off your radio when I get done and say, That guy's nuts if you want to. It isn't going to make a particle of difference to me. I happen to believe what I'm telling you, because I have seen it, but you make up your own mind. Only thing is, I want you to remember that I didn't get excited and holler at you, and I didn't try to scare you. So take it or leave it, partner. I'll personally feel a good bit better for having told you, and that's enough. So, our lights went out. So, we weren't where we thought we were at all. We were lost. 3,700 feet down in the earth. And I'm scared, and I know if I let Louis know I'm scared, there's going to be trouble, the way he is. So I said, give me a match, Louis. I said, and I'll light our lamps again. I, I haven't got any matches. And I remember the match I used before was my last one, so I didn't say anything for a minute. 
Mm. Pretty soon, Louis began to cry in the dark. Mm. And I tried to shut him up. I said, hey, cut it out, Louis. We'll be down here after us in no time. And Louis kept right on crying and crying. And I said, Louis, do you hear me? We'll be right out of here before dark. We'll, we'll ride on over to Meterville. We'll have a big Italian dinner, I said. I said, we'll have spaghetti and some of that hot sausage with peppers. And we'll have a big veal cutlet and ravioli. We'll get Dominic to bring out a bottle of Barbera. And all the time I'm talking, I'm getting hungrier and hungrier. Louis sitting there in the dark crying. Mama. And I go on talking about food and red wine and stuff. Pretty soon I notice Louis isn't crying anymore. And I stop and I listen. And I figure I've talked him out of his crying for a while. I say, how about it, Louis? You go for that, huh? That meterville business? Louis? Louis! Louis! Say something, will you? Is the guy fainted? Louis, where are you? Listen, Louis, don't do that to me. I can hear you breathing. That isn't Louis you hear, son. Who are you? Tom. Who? Tom McDonald. Tom McDonald. Where do you come from, Tom? Back there. Where's Louis? You went back there. Back where? Down the tunnel? Mm-hmm. By himself? Mm-hmm. Why, he was so scared. He's not scared anymore. Well, that's funny. Say, I'm sure glad you came, Tom. Sure. You got a match, Tom? Match? No. How am I going to light my lamp? I don't think you are going to light it. Well, how am I going to get out of here, then? What? I said, how am I going to get out of here, then? Oh. Why, I don't think you are going to get out of here, Link. What did you say? Come on with me. Where? With me. Come on. Where are we going? Back there. With Louie? With all of us. All of who? Come on, Link. Where are you? Right here. I hear you breathing, but I can't... That's not me, Link. What? Well, who else is here? Who is it I hear? Tom, answer me. Why, son, that's the earth you hear breathing. And that was when I remembered that Tom McDonald had been buried in a cave in the year before, and they'd never found his body. I sat there in the dark for a while, I guess, before I spoke again. You know, unless you've been down there, you haven't any idea how quiet it is that far underground. There isn't any echo when you speak. Your voice is just as flat as if you're talking into a blanket. And you think you hear things. You think you hear somebody walking in the dark, and you listen, and it's nothing but the blood pounding in your ears. You listen close, and you hear a sound you never heard before in all your life. The sound of your heart beating. And in the dark, with your matches gone, and somebody there with you that says he's a man who's been dead for a year. He didn't speak for a while, either. I didn't know whether he was still there or not. I called to him. Tom, I said. Tom McDonald? He didn't answer. He was letting me think things over. Letting me decide I'd better follow him if I ever hoped to get out of there. What did he mean, though? He didn't think I was going to get out? Where did he want me to go? I thought of the Indian pictures. The terrible face, the flames, the figures of the bearded men. What else was back there in that tunnel where Tom McDonald wanted me to go? I felt my hair begin to rise. He spoke again, right in my ear. Come on, Link. Get up. I got up. I listened for his footsteps. I heard him speak again. Come on. And I made up my mind. I followed him into the blackness. 
I smacked my forehead against the walls as I followed Tom's footsteps down the twisting tunnel. I stumbled in the wet darkness. I called to him. Tom! Hey, Tom! And the only answer was plodding footsteps ahead of me. What could I do? I didn't dare to stop. I had to follow him. And we walked on, and it was always downhill, and I was so tired I could hardly take another step. And there seemed to be a little glow of reddish light ahead, and the footsteps went on and on. I wanted to stop and rest, but I could hear him ahead of me, and somehow I knew if I stopped I'd never catch up with him again. And then the footsteps halted, and the voice spoke again. Stop right there, Link. Are we nearly out of here, Tom? Be still. And a little reddish glow of lights began to glow brighter and I looked ahead to see where it came from. I looked around to see who this was that was pretending to be a man dead for a year, and I looked around to find my friend who had disappeared into the darkness. And there wasn't anybody. I stood there alone, and the light got brighter and brighter, and I heard Tom's voice. Don't move, Link. And I heard Louis Sullivan's voice. Don't be afraid, Link. And the light got brighter and brighter, and I couldn't see anybody. And then suddenly it seemed like a great curtain was flung aside, and the place was brighter than day, brighter than 10,000 days. And still I heard Louie's voice. Stand still, Link. And I heard Tom McDonald's voice. Look down, Link. Look down. And I looked down. I looked down into flames that leaped at me from a thousand miles below. Red and green and blue and... Colors I never knew existed. It was like looking down from a mountaintop on a whole world of fire, and the flames leaped and pulsed like the beating of a great heart as I looked at them there below me, and saw... Watch, Link. Watch, watch. And in the great sea of flames below, I thought I saw a face. A face that filled the whole world, it seemed. And it was a cruel face, but somehow a serene face. And its eyes gazed into mine. And then it faded, and then I heard the voices again. You saw her, Link. We saw her. And I tore my eyes away from the flames below, and there stood Louie and Tom MacDonald. And I said, without any surprise at all, Yes, I saw her. It was the face in that Indian picture back there, wasn't it? You saw her. Who? Who is she, Tom? That is Mother Earth, son. No, I wasn't surprised. Tom MacDonald stood there on the brink of that sea of flames and looked at me and talked to me, and I knew it was Tom MacDonald, even though I knew Tom MacDonald was dead. I recognized him. Tom MacDonald, when I knew him, had been clean-shaven. Now he was wearing a beard like some patriarch out of holy writ, but there was no doubt in my mind. I can hear that voice of his as a matter of fact as it had ever been. The earth lives, son. The earth lives the same as we do. She gives us all the gifts that she thinks are good for her children, and some of her gifts she's still keeping till we're ready for them. She's a good mother to us all. But when we don't do right, she can be a terrible mother. And I swear the flames leaped higher when he said that. She asks very little from us, son. But what belongs to her, she takes. And all of us belong to her. To Mother Earth. Then the sea of flames below us seemed to make a kind of great music. It was almost a voice, chanting something that I knew I ought to understand, but couldn't quite get. And as the flames reached higher again, and the music rolled at us in their light, I saw hundreds, thousands, millions of men and women standing there on that same ledge we were standing on, gazing down into into the face of Mother Earth, dim and raging fires. And the flames rose higher, and the music sounded louder, and suddenly the flames swept up to us, all the millions of people I hadn't seen, and I heard Tom McDonald's voice again, through the music and the roar of flames. Mother Earth takes us now. You were the one that is left. You will know what to do. 
and the flames fell back again, and I was all alone, alone with Mother Earth. It was dark again, but I could see, and I could see the smile on her face, and I knew. And so I've come to tell you, partner, I don't care whether you believe me or not. I know what I believe. I know what I learned. I know that this place under the city of Butte, Montana, county seat of Silverbow County, population 1940, 37,081, elevation above sea level approximately one mile. I know that this place is not the only one in the world where there's a gateway to Mother Earth and her fires. I know there is one back of a certain hangar at Tempelhof Field in Berlin. I know about one near Moto Lake in California. There's one a few miles from Haberstow, New York. And there are many others. No, you can't find them, partner. And the reason why nobody's heard of them is simple. Have you guessed it? That's right. Nobody ever comes back to tell about them. There's just one or two other things to tell you, and then I'll be going. Every year, one of these... I'll call them gateways. Every year, one of the gateways supplies the people from Mother Earth. It was Butte in 1932. Last year, they came from a place in Mexico where there's an ancient Maya ruin. In the years between, we who are left go back and bring people back to our underground caverns to wait. You've heard of people disappearing. There was that man who disappeared from room 307 of the Finland Hotel in Butte. A girl named Lucien from down on Mercury Street in Butte. People who drop out of sight and are never heard of again. That's what becomes of them. They belong to Mother Earth. Incidentally, remember I told you about the gateway behind the hangar and Tempelhof Field in Berlin? Wasn't there a man and a woman who disappeared a couple of years ago in Berlin? Quite well-known people? Don't worry about them. They belong to Mother Earth with all the rest. This year it's our turn again in Butte. We haven't got quite enough people yet, but we'll get them. Mother Earth takes what belongs to her. So maybe some night you'll wake up suddenly in the dark and you'll hear somebody breathing when you know there isn't anybody there. Maybe you'll believe me then. Maybe. We'll see, partner, won't we? You have been listening to Quiet Please. Tonight's story, A Mile High and a Mile Deep, was written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And Lon Clark played Louis Sullivan. Tom was Edgar Stelly. The music was composed and played by Gene Perrazzo. Now for a word about next week's story, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Next week we have the story of a murderer by proxy, and the fate that overtakes him. It's called Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. And until next week, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chapel. This program came to you from New York. This is the world's largest network, mutual broadcasting system.